Hi, I'm Chai Hoffelenia, and you're watching a Rappler, Rappler special on the MILF GPH peace process. Also with me to ask the questions are Rappler's managing editor, Glenda Gloria. Glenda also wrote, uh, along with Marites Vitog, um, the book Under the Crescent Moon, which was published in the year 2000. And we also have Angela Kasawai, uh, one of the Rappler reporters. Um, Angela has covered the House of Representatives and recently also um, visited Tawi Tawi. On October 25, 2012, the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front signed the historic framework agreement on the Bangsa Moro. The signing comes after 15 years of negotiations and 40 years of conflict in Mindanao. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Iqbal. We're, uh, we'd like to welcome you to this discussion on um, the Bangsa Moro and, and the peace process. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you, did you ever think that you would reach this day when you would be talking about the nitty-gritty of um, um, a new political entity? Or did you imagine that until today you would still be waging war? We know, I know that we have that ultimate objective. Mm -hmm. I know that we have our destination. But I would like to liken it someone traveling the ocean. Mm -hmm. He does not know how long the trip is, but it's just like what Magellan did to, their, to his sailors. Sail, 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 and sail, and there it's the Visayas. Mm -hmm. That's how I, 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 I saw how we move forward with this struggle. So this is something that you welcome, I suppose, after all these years? Well, it's something self-fulfilling. Because after all those years of hard struggle, of uh, struggling against uh, the enemy, pardon me for calling it an enemy because we used to call them an enemy, although right now the government and the armed force of the Philippines are partners, our partners in search of real peace in Mindanao. You started out as a very young revolutionary. Uh, you, you joined the MNLF at the age of 22? I think around 22 years old. What pushed you to? Well, it's my idealism. It's the concrete situation of my people that I cannot uh, really accept that someone has to take no nothing. Someone has to take something in order to change the situation. But it's like maybe when we talk about the MILF and the government, um, some people forget that um, you have a long history of, of struggle and the man behind that for most is Hashim Salamat. And uh, we were talking earlier that it's been almost 10 years ago since he died. How would Hashim react to the framework agreement that you signed with the government, you think? I think he would be the uh, he would be the happiest man in the world. If you remember, mm -hmm. he, has an, he has written a book. Yeah. The title of the book is Guidelines mm -hmm. for the Bangsamoro. And he clearly stated in that book that for our people to exercise the right to self-determination, it can either be expressed in two ways establishing an independent state or having a meaningful autonomy. And what we have now, hopefully we would be able to settle everything, it's not just meaningful autonomy, mm -hmm. but it would be the best of autonomies. Yes. So I said if he were alive today, he would be one of the highest, happiest man in the world. They say that you've mellowed down um, through the years as from, from revolutionary, uh, you're, you're, you're mellowed down as a, as a fighter. Mellowed down in the sense of the two options, independent state and mm -hmm. meaningful autonomy. But totally in the strict sense of the word, we did not mellow down, we just followed what is being said as our objective, either independent state or we can achieve an autonomy that is truly meaningful. So it's not true to say that we have mellowed down. 
But it must have been tough from Abu Bakar to Opap. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is a negotiated political settlement. And negotiated political settlement, you have to, you have to follow the track in between. You cannot be, you cannot follow the track in accordance with what government says. Neither can you follow or can you, you can pursue the track in the realm of a revolutionary. Because this is something negotiated settlement. You have to compromise. The transition committee met yesterday. Uh, what's the latest? Actually, there were three big events yesterday. One was the opening program, where, among others, um, Senator Genguna was there, Congressman Sakdalan was there, uh, Secretary Teresita Deles was there, and some congressmen. That was the first event yesterday. The second event was about the press conference. It was a tough uh, press conference, particularly about two-thirds of the questions related, uh, were, were related to the Sabah issue. Yes. Yes. And the third one was the initial, uh, the maiden se session of the Transition Commission. Mm. And it was uh, a very good engagement uh, among the members of the Transition Commission. Mm. Sir, what were you able to talk about during that first meeting? Well, of course, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the rules of the Transition Commission, the internal rules. Mm -hmm. We also talk about uh, the formation of the Secretariat mm -hmm. and then uh, organization of committees because, you know, the Transition Commission has three or four tasks. One is the writing of the basic law. Another is uh, making proposal to amend the constitution if necessary. And then the third task is about uh, socioeconomic development. And then the fourth one is about uh, relevant uh, functions. So we formally uh, organize the three committees. As to the fourth committee, we still have to look at it very closely. It will depend on the necessity that will come later. What obstacles do you see ahead? What, what are the major roadblocks you think the Commission would be facing, the most difficult phase? The first law roadblock is the unfinished business of the negotiation. Mm. We have still three outstanding issues very substantive issues in the negotiating table. Wealth sharing, power sharing, and normalization. Yeah. And we cannot move forward substantially unless the three annexes are finished. So what we did yesterday was just an initial effort on our part. But until and unless the three annexes will be settled by the parties, then we cannot move forward. They say that um, negotiations can move forward if, to begin with, there is trust among um, people involved in the negotiations. How would you describe your relations with um, the GPH panel? Trust and confidence among negotiators are important, but it is not a precondition. Because you cannot dictate whom to talk to on the side of the government. Neither can they dictate to the Emalet whom to talk to. But, you know, as a negotiator, I face uh, five negotiators from the government. And the five personalities that I have faced have different personalities, uh, dif have different uh, uh, way of uh, approach. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in a negotiation is something that you have to interact and you have to change your approach if the other party is not uh, the same as what you faced before. So it's, it's, it's about something that, uh, that requires adjustment. adjustment. After all, in a negotiation, there is nothing personal. We have to be soft on people, whoever is in the opposite end of the table, but we have to be hard on issues. What did you have to adjust in terms of your own style? Because individual differences. Mm -hmm. 
even in the way of uh, talking, people differ. Some speak softly, some speak very harsh. I'm not saying that uh, any of my counterpart had this, this had spoken harshly, but just I'm just describing the differences among people. So you have to make adjustment. After all, the main task of a negotiator is, at the end of the day, you have to agree. You have to agree. But so sir, does it, does it help that you have good personal relations with your fellow negotiator? For example, in the case of former um, peace panel chief um, Arvik Leon and now Associate mm -hmm. Justice, how, was, how would you describe your relationship with him? Well, you know, it's no-no in a negotiation to describe mm -hmm. the the personality of your counterpart in negotiation. Maybe in private I can. <laughs> <laughs> but were you sorry to see him go? No, no, you know, we have been friends indeed. Not just, uh, not just uh, Leonin, even Afable, uh, Garcia, uh, Siges, and then uh, Leonin. Of course, you feel something because you have been there for how many, day, uh, how many months, how many years. So you have already adjusted with each other. So of course, uh, it's something that is uh, not good to, to see that your uh, partner in a negotiation has to go because you have already made the adjustment. Yes. Uh, you have two years to complete um, negotiations, and but you've lost you've lost some time because of the um, delays and postponements of, of the meeting. Um, do you think you you can still catch up and uh, accomplish what you need to accomplish? I fully trust the president. He has the sincerity. He has the commitment. And I think the president also finds in the MILF a trustworthy partner in the peace process. As long as we remain committed and sincere to the peace process, we can overcome everything. We can overcome everything. After all, uh, although the issues are still very difficult, but we can still find a way to move forward. Is this additional pressure on your part to um, move things as fast as you can, while given given this this precedent? Yes, but uh, what is important is that if there is a delay, it's not on the part of the 